For those of you who are on a completely different time zone, your call bar is out of sync, so I really appreciate it. I'll try and keep you awake. Uh, if you nod off, it's like no big deal, So, uh, and we'll talk about it later. Um, so, uh, you know, I have to put this slide in. This is a picture of the Great Wall of China, and a couple years ago I went to China for the first time, and like most people from North America, we decided, oh, we have to go see the Great Wall, so we have to go see the Great Wall. And... Uh, the funny thing is, you know, you have this tour guide, and they're sort of telling you little tidbits about the Great Wall of China. And he told us this little story that I thought was sort of funny. And, and he said, well, the Great Wall of China was really built many, many years ago, of course, and of course, over, over a lot of time. And the Chinese at the time were worried about other armies outside of China invading. And they were thinking, well, you know, we don't have such a good military at the moment. But we are really good builders, so what can we do about that? And so they, so they, built, this, they built this wall, and that was their way of uh, addressing the problem. And so I thought, well, it'd be very appropriate at Chinese Kai to, to talk about building, because obviously you guys and the Chinese know how to build, build, build stuff. <laughs> so what do I mean, mean by building stuff? I'm sorry, that's such a casual way of saying it, but it really means constructing, making stuff. <clears throat> And we joke at Autodesk that uh, we mean by what we mean by build stuff is anything that God didn't make. Sort of, so it's all the man-made stuff. And uh, I work at Autodesk, and we make computer design software. So you know, nowadays most things that are built at some point probably have been touched by a computer or designed in a computer. If not, they soon will will be. So here's just the basic range. You can see over there in the corner, that's a classic sort of drafting thing. And that's where Autodesk got its start, with early drafting tools. Uh, but now we run the full gamut. If you look at the far right-hand side, you see things like special effects, where you're actually building stuff. They're only meant for the virtual world, ultimately for the screen, but still there's a whole bunch of building involved. And sort of the extreme versions of buildings, of course, there's always the automotive example, which are you know, extremely complicated robotic machines nowadays. Uh, and uh, things like constructing buildings, so architecture is a big thing, and actually constructing entire cities. Uh, and even more constructed and manufactured things are things like manufacturing plants, and factories, etc. Uh, so those are the sort of things that computer-aided design does nowadays. So I'm going to talk about really the future about, about how people make things. Uh, and I'm sort of going to argue that it's actually a fairly bright future, especially for us people in the computer world and in the computer science world. Uh, because trends in technology are going to make things more easier to build, and also we're going to build way more interesting things. And really the, uh, the crux of my talk is really based on the observation of the computer industry. Um, you know. Like, I think, you know, I, I, the first computer I saw was, let me say, I'm just trying to think back now. You know, it was probably in, you know, like, 1979 or something when I first applied to university and I had to take this course on computers. I couldn't get into electrical engineering, so I took the computer science thing, whatever that was. And here I am today. Uh, but what the computer industry did was complete genius, really. Is that in the old days we would hand build computers? And that's what that upper image is. Somebody literally hand building a computer system. Uh, and of course, technological developments like integrated circuits allow them to miniaturize things, and more importantly, allow them to have computers or systems to build systems. And so what they're able to do is take a lot of the tasks that are sort of mundane and abstract them away. So now, if you design a com a, a computer chip, a large part of it is done by the computer. All the transistor layouts, stuff like that. The actual designers don't really know where exactly those trans transistors end up on the chip, but they're broadly placing the functionality to get what they want. And then the process of actually printing and manufacturing those things is literally a, a, a computer-based printing process. So those are the key things that they really were able to abstract and design at higher levels, make more and more complicated things. And that's why you get the raging success of the, of, of, of the computer world, where a computer, you know, uh, uh, if you just compare it to cars, for example, a car from the 1950s versus now, it's not sort of the same price, the same functionality. 
But that's not true of computers now. They're, they're mobile, they're small, etc., etc. Uh, and to some extent, this is going to happen uh, to computer-aided design and the world of making. And really what I'm getting at is what we really want to do here is what we're striving for is to program the physical world in the same manner that we program the virtual world, because that has a lot of really good attributes. And so what do I mean? So uh, here's a simple example. Suppose you wanted to make this pencil holder, right? In the sort of traditional way. And I'm a real maker of things, so I sort of know how this goes, right? You get a block of wood and you drill some holes in it and you put the pencils in. That's sort of the oversimplified version. The real, real version is, well, I have to decide what wood I'm going to use, then I have to go get the stock, and I have to cut the stock down to size, and I have to pick a wood that's finishable, uh, and then I have to drill the holes. Oh, guess what? I need drill press to drill the holes because they're not straight, etc., etc. So manual fabrication is really complicated in certain ways. And in, but in other ways, it's very simple because it's very direct. You grab a piece of wood and you start drilling. Now, here's a little bit more modern example. This is something that our student intern did. Uh, not as a big project, you know, just sort of fun amidst the rest of her research. And this is a, a plastic pencil holder that she designed using a computer and then 3D print, printed it out. Uh, so the thing to note is that it doesn't look much like the material that it's made out of. She's able to readily modify the shape. Uh, and it's also, what you can see, it's, it's actually augmented with some electronics inside that allow it to sense what pencil's in the pencil holder. Uh, the point is that this is a very different process. It, being, it began on the computer and was 3D printed out. So really what happens in this case is it, it somewhat changes like who is doing the making, what they're capable of making, um, how they go about doing it, and where, 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 where they can do the making. And so the key part of my talk, and the, the, the three takeaway points are going to be that, in terms of technology trends, 3D printing is going to make a difference. And we're starting to see it make a difference sort of in our lives as researchers. Um, the other thing that's going to change is what is buildable. And I'll talk more about that in my talk. And finally, I really believe that the way we design things is going to change uh, for, the, for the better. So let me first talk about 3D printing. And You've probably all heard about, heard about 3D printing, or maybe even you have a 3D printer and you're using one, one yourself now. Uh, and so the notion and the act of 3D printing is very, very compelling and super cool. Uh, you know, and sort of in the limit, we imagine this great scenario where, oh, I order something from Amazon, I click buy now, and then it prints out on my 3D printer. So I order the newest cell phone, and <laughs> there it is, I've got it on my 3D printer, which is totally good. Uh, uh, unfortunately, we're quite a long ways away from that scenario. Uh, there's a certain notion that there'll be a 3D printer in, in, in every home. And this is sort of a myth. I think it's a question of sort of time frame. Um, right now, when we talk to people who are heavy users of 3D printers, they're the type of people that are, they're the woodworkers, the mechanical folks, sort of the real makers. Uh, and, you know, the hobbyists, right? So th those are the types of people that have power saws in their home, and things, things like that. So it's not sh sort of, you know, your, your mom doesn't have a 3D printer because she needs uh, plastic figurines readily, right? So that's not really there yet. Uh, and the reason I included this toaster is that the president of Autodesk is a real maker, has his own wood woodworking shop and stuff like that. And uh, he says he's a heavy user of 3D print printers, and, and, and then he's... Then he also says, yeah, I use it maybe just a little bit more than I use my toaster. So, you know, it's sort of a good comparison. You know, it's, you, know you don't think of your toaster as this ubiquitously used, constant use thing. You use it in the morning to make toast. It's no big deal. Uh, and then there's people uh, who are sort of claiming the 3D printers are going to be the next industrial revolution. Um, this sort of remains to be seen. Uh, you know, some of the challenges there is we have amazing methods to manufacture things en masse. Uh, so to think about replacing those with 3D printing te technology is a real challenge. I'm not saying that's going to happen, but I'm saying that it's not as simple as like, oh, suddenly I can 3D print something and I'm going to stop making, you know, 20-ton 
uh, mold press machines. That's that's a very different different thing. But perhaps it will come along one day. So enough sort of negativity. So three <clears throat> D printing is terribly awesome for <clears throat> for those of us who have done three D printing. <clears throat> And there's a couple of key reasons when you look at it carefully. First of all, essentially, the complexity of the shape comes for free. So, uh, if you have a very complicated wooden piece, you always have to think about sort of carving it out of wood. And so the complexity of it, it takes a lot of time to carve a really complicated piece. The 3D printer ultimately does not care how complicated it is. It doesn't care whether you print a, a cube, or something like this basket on top with a lot of manual detail to it. Good, because it isn't manual. So it has this wonderful uh, ability to do extreme shape complexity for free. And se second of all, depending on the, the way the, the 3D printing process works, there's shapes that you can create that are not possible in a given medium. Again, looking at this, this basket, that's actually made out of bronze and metal. And there's no way to actually cast that out of bronze. So you have to do that. You have to make that with a with a three D printer. There's also other sort of not so obvious and possible things that three D printers do. Like here's a really good example. This is just a little plastic part with with some gears inside, and you can turn the gears, and the other gears rotate. But the reason this is an important example is because there's you can't. You can't make the gears separately and then assemble them. They have to be 3D printed as a, as a whole. So 3D printing allows some of these really sort of non-intuitive things to happen. Now getting in a little bit more, we're really at the start of sort of what we're capable of doing with 3D printing. Um, there's companies are working feverishly on, on the material science for this stuff and some of the great promises. Okay, thank you. And some of the great promise of this technology is in the combination of materials. So normally when you work with a material, you sort of get uh, a homogeneous distribution of the, of, of the material in the part. So in other words, generally a piece of steel is the same type of steel from beginning to end. But with 3D printing, we can vary the material throughout. So you can make a part that is very stiff on one end and very bendable in, on the other end and gradually changes throughout. You can make a part that, you know, twists readily in one direction, but does not twist at all in the other in the other direction. Simply by the way you deposit the material on the part. So essentially, what you're doing is you're making digital materials. So materials that you can program the behavior in from the computer and then print them out. So that's a really critical and, and, and new property that 3D printers bring bring to the table. So before I don't want to oversell you on 3D printing. There's a whole bunch of problems left, right? For those of you who 3D print and you know exactly what I'm talking about, right? Some of the parts are weak, right? Kind of expensive sometimes, especially the high-end print printers. The reliability, you know, this is new technology. It's not all that reliable. The size. Uh, Autodesk has done some great projects where we printed out a complete motorcycle, and that was a huge challenge. We didn't print out the motorcycle as a whole, but part by part. So the biggest part on a motorcycle is like the tire, probably. Uh, but, you know, printing pad size is a problem. Uh, the speed, as all of us know, it's like, yes, it doesn't appear right away. It doesn't appear after like three or four hours. You have to wait a long, long time. And the overall qual quality of the part. And uh, the second is the whole chemical nature of it. Some of these processes, especially printing metal, me sorry, metals, it's a very toxic process. Uh, so it has to be done in a special chamber and stuff like that. Plastics are quite a bit better. Uh, but those are all the basic challenges that we face. So what most people don't realize is that we probably overvalued the sort of the consumer side of 3D printing, where it's like, oh yeah, I'm going to get a 3D MakerBot in my home and I'll print out these cool figurines or bobble, bobble heads, even though that's a very important function within society. Uh, but the real value, or at least one of the real, I think, underestimated values is the value of 3D printing in the industrial process. And here's just some really great examples. Uh, this example here in the upper left uh, is a piece of metal that's printed out on a 3D metal printer, a metal laser sintering machine. And the, 
they're able to print a pattern in the metal that when you, when, sorry, when you place this into someone's body as a hip replacement or a, a knee replacement part, the pattern, the texture of the metal, allows the bone to readily grow in, into it. And they found out through experimentation that there's certain patterns that work very, very well. And really, you can only 3D print that. You, you can't imagine someone by hand sort of carving this thing out. It's sort of this crazy concept. Um, the other example on the right, upper, uh, is an example of making parts uh, uh, lighter weight. And the real critical example, of course, uh, is the aerospace world, where weight on an airplane, like one, one pound of extra weight on an airplane, translates to millions of dollars in operating expenses over the 30-year lifetime of a, of a plane. So they're very interested in ways that they can lightweight their parts. And really that part shown there, there's no other way you can sort of get that honey coat pattern within. There's no mold that you can do or anything like that. It has to be printed sort of layer, layer by layer. And similar with these other examples on the, on the bottom. Okay, so another thing about 3D printing. Uh, so, you know, this is a picture from, Autodesk is this really cool office for, for a software company, I gotta admit. You know, I'm kind of cynical about corporations and stuff like this, but I think one of the coolest things we ever did uh, was we started this. Basically, it's a it's a it's a maker shop. It's a shop. It's down at Pier Nine in San, San Francisco, and um, here's just some pictures from it. On the upper corner, that's our our 3D print, printing room. So we get a bunch of 3D printers in there, and you go in there, and there's nowadays there's like you know three or four out of the I don't know how many there are. There's quite a few, probably a dozen or something. You know, there's 3D printers out there humming and working away, printing out stuff. Uh, and, uh, but what people forget is, like, 3D printers can't do everything. So, the picture on the right there is this really sort of groovy little fun project that someone did where they said, oh, I want to have a robot drummer, so some way that I can have drumsticks hit a drum and have this all controlled by a, by a computer. So, sort of like a player piano, but for, for uh, drum, drum kits. And if you think about doing that project, yeah, you want to 3D print a few parts of the actuators and stuff like that, but there's a whole bunch of other things you have to do. You have to, you know, cut some pieces of wood, saw some metal and stuff like that. And you can probably see in the picture, well, it's not close enough, but there's pieces of pipe screwed together. So really, in the rest of our shop, we have other things like we have a full CNC milling section, so you can mill out metal parts using sort of standard things that drill and cut, you know, using the you're using the computer, and that's the image at the bottom. And furthermore, the image on the bottom right, we have like standard metal and wood and, 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 and woodworking shots. I think those are the things that people sort of forget, is that if you're actually making things, you sort of need the full solution to do the project. And anyone who's ever done a real project with a 3D printer, besides like making a bobblehead, uh, uh, has, has found out like, oh yeah, the breadth of the things that I want to do are very, very, you know, it's very, very good. So, what else can we print? Well, you know, you can think about doing things like, well, we need parts to be stronger. And one of the images up there uh, is the image of a, a carbon fiber printer. So people are experimenting and developing some of these new things, and, and they'll probably work out, and we'll have you know carbon fiber printed parts. You can also think about printing things on a much larger scale. There's people experimenting with printing sort of building size things, these giant 3D printers that sort of go back and forth and print out your house for you. Those are, those to me are sort of the obvious ones. Uh, what I really think about and what I find really interesting is this notion of programmable matter. Uh, so it's not so interesting to think about what can be 3D printed. It's, I think it's more interesting to think, well, what can I control, what matter can I control and program with a computer? Uh, and this is the very central concept of this notion of programmable matter. So I'll show you this sort of neat graph that we started making. So if you think about sort of the range of matter, you know, from atoms up to bigger things like planets and stuff like that, you have a range from small to large, right? Uh, and in sort of traditional building, you build, the parts are, you know, bricks, lumber, steel, parts, integrated circuits, computer chips, etc., etc., right? Those are the things of, about this size, you know, sort of human arm, arm with size. And those things we assemble into buildings, cars, etc., etc. 
And those things, we assemble into cities and factories, right? But if you look at the bottom of the graph, the really small things, you know, we build those higher, those larger things out of alloys, plastics, and out of technology, etc. Right? So that's sort of the obvious one, and we all know that. So the interesting insight is that, uh, actually, this is sort of the non-organic, the dead world, right? You can look at the living world, which is the organic world, and try and apply it to, the, to this graph. Uh, and so you can think that, well, for the non-organic world, that's where computer-aided design is sort of working out, right? But if you look at the organic world, the really small stuff is molecular design. Things like DNA, bacteria, viruses. Uh, those things get collected in nature, or in the life sciences, through things like cells and tissues, etc. And those into organs and limbs, and organisms, and then into environments and ecologies. So there's this nice parallel. And I think really that computer-aided design is going to move into that parallel. And I'm going to argue why that's going to be. So really there's, there's this movement now where to treat biology uh, as sort of a predictable, programmable building materials. Uh, and it's based on the fact that, well, we've been studying biology for a long time. There's a whole bunch of stuff we don't know. And it's frustrating, all the things we don't know. But there are some things that we do know and that we can replicate in sort of an engineering way, much the way that during the Industrial Revolution, thing, uh, you know, uh, people learn about steel and the properties of steel, and they're able to work with it in a predictable way by creating tables of stresses and, and, and st structural understandings. We could build things like bridges that didn't fall over. And so biology, some parts of it, are starting to become like that. So here's a sort of interesting example, because it sort of immediately intersects with the stuff that I just said about 3D printing. Um, so this is a, a 3D printer that prints out uh, living cells. And so you probably heard the news reports about, oh, I think it's the company Organova, but there are other companies at the research lab doing this. They're printing out, you know, a human liver and stuff like that. Now, ultimately, that's where these guys want to go with this stuff. But really, there's great value in the near term of just printing out tissues of cells for, for things like running, running lab experiments or testing whether a drug uh, will be effective uh, will hurt your liver, will actually maybe can reproduce some of the cells of your liver, put it on a, on a tissue, put it on a microfluidics device, and then use that as the, as the means of testing. So rather than animal testing, we'll have testing, whoops, we'll have testing on a, testing on a chip, uh, which will be much more accurate because we won't, you know, no one really cares that, oh, the mouse has a bad reaction to the drug. We really want to care if you have a bad reaction. So save a couple mice, we'll make some tissues and we'll run it through automatically. Uh, so I think this will be a really dramatic effect. Now, I'll give you another great example of this stuff. I'm not planning on hitting the mic one more time, so... Uh, <clears throat> this is this really interesting example where scientists are using DNA not to create living things, but to create really small st structures. And they call these uh, structures robots. But really they're sort of, in my world, they're sort of mechanical widgets. Uh, and the way this little structure works is that you create uh, DNA that uh, forms itself into this sort of cylinder that has a, uh, has a hinge on one end, and then on the other end, on the other end, there are these little red things uh, that are the keys that allows the cylinder to open up. So it's sort of this half climb thing. And the, the little uh, objects at the very end, the uh, keys, the way they're set up is that when they... The idea is that you, you, you take this little machine and you put it in your body, it floats around in your bloodstream, and when it contacts a cell that has a certain geometry on the outside of the cell, that causes the key... Uh, the keys open up and the clamshell opens up. Okay, so that's the basic mechanism. But what they've done is the key uh, is set up to open up when it comes in contact with the cancer cell. And on the inside of the cancer cell are the antibodies that naturally in your body cause the cell to shut itself down. 
Uh, and so it was really interesting when we met these guys. They're like, well, this is as cool as cool could get, right? Uh, and they were explaining how this stuff works, and you know, it was just sort of flooring. And the one question that they had was like, well, can you guys make some tools that are easier for us to use? Because although you know we figured out this really complicated thing called life sciences, uh, you know, we need tools that are simpler to use to build structures like like this. Uh, so really, they were using existing. Uh, CAD tools to build structures like, like this. So, uh, so actually, when we when, when we met them, they were using one of our tools. Actually, not a not a design tool, but an animation tool, Maya. And they were designing these mini st structures. And from that, they wrote a plugin that would allow them to specify the DNA sequence that was needed to generate a structure like that. So they would take that sequence send it off to a DNA manufacturing company, and then they would get the DNA back, put it in a fluid, uh, heat it up and shake it, wait a bit, and they would get these little structures that appear, and the image on the right-hand side is from an, ele uh, an electron mic microscope. And you can see they actually have these structures of these particular shapes. So that was sort of phase one. In phase two, we met with them, and they were testing their, their little devices uh, against cancer cells and non-cancer cells in a petri, petri dish. And they do, it does cause cancer cells to be killed. So they're at the very start of this sort of nanorobotic computer design machines to put in your body to kill cancer. Uh, and so it's sort of those types of applications of design that I, I think are, there's going to be a lot of really fertile ground to work, work on that stuff. So just not to get you overly excited now, I think Sean tells me, who's the researcher that did the majority of this work, that the problem now is the liver kills off the little, the little machines. So they've got to put something on those machines that causes the liver from being squashed. I don't know if Asim, if you know what's the story in that. I don't know. Okay. Um, so just to give you more of a sense of it, you know, there's conferences like this tiny little biomod conference, which I had to show, which is about using DNA to create little, really, really small things. In this case, the, the original work just showed, showed you how by manipulating DNA on a computer and then printing it up, you can get things that assemble themselves into small, smiley faces. Uh, but uh, the key thing here is to notice if you read sort of the great text there, it says, undergraduate teams compete to master control of biomolecules. Uh, uh, focus areas include uh, biomolecule robotics, logic, and computing st structures. So, you know, this is really interesting stuff. And just to reinforce this point a little bit more, uh, you know, here's a newsletter back from the early 70s of the Homebrew Computer Club, where people, students, and hobbyists were sort of messing around with computers, trying different things and stuff like that. And you can, can compare that to the image on the right, which is uh, somebody's closet from their dorm room where they have their own synthetic biology kit in there and their own little heating oven and clay and stuff like that. Um, so that world of synthetic biology, designing with biology, is sort of at that, at that stage. Uh, back in the days when computers were really big and really expensive. And you can imagine what it's going to be like 30 years from now. So we'll see. Um, Here's just another example. Uh, this is the International Genetically Engineered Machine Competition. Uh, and really what this is, it's most notable that these are not all PhD researchers. This is a combination of undergraduate students and high school students as a summer project. They actually get a kit, a synthetic biology kit, and they're able to do projects on it. So, and the projects they do, they take the, the results that they have and they uh, uh, register them as common ways or common building blocks that you can do more projects on. So they're turning uh, uh, biology into sort of an engineering practice. So one of the award-winning uh, projects was a, uh, a project to modify moss so that you could, uh, so that they would biodegrade the pollutants that are present in, in, in water. And they would put it in these arrays and float it out on a lake, and the moss eats up all the pollution and turns into a completely harmless substance. So they're really building up this sort of registry of very slow tricks and things that you can do with biology that are very well known and under, understood. So that even sort of, you know, average intelligent people can readily work with this stuff. 
Um, so here's another interesting example, and it sort of treads this line between the living and the non-living. Uh, so uh, one of the things I mentioned about 3D printers printing multiple materials is this notion that you can print something out and then have it modify itself into the function or into the shape which you in, in, intended. So here's an example uh, from our research lab. Uh, let me get this plan. So this is a stick where we're simulating the effect of, of everywhere you see those little lines there, there's actually a spongy material that absorbs water a little bit faster than the, than the plastic. Uh, and so the idea is that if you were to, to print this out and immerse it in water, it would form itself into a cube shape. So we've programmed that in. And as you wait, I, the, Carlos just hit the simulation button and runs the simulation. And you can see it form into, form into the shape. So that's the sort of designing this thing, make, making sure we have the right materials in the right spots. And it forms into this sort of cube, cube shape, sort of out of the bent wire. Now, working with our buddy at MIT, Skyler Tibbetts, uh, he's been using this software to build the real version of this, which is a 3D printed out piece. And there it is, he takes it, he drops it into a tank of water. And it's made out of multiple materials. And you can see over time, notice that the camera speeded up 75x here. <laughs> <laughs> but over time, sort of like a bio biological process, it assumes its final, its final shape. So that's where the notion, not only is it 3D printing, but it's the printing over time. I think it's time. It takes forever. <laughs> Okay, so that's sort of the span of 3D printing and di different types of things that we can digitally create or programmable matter. And now I'd like, like to uh, move on to sort of the, the way that we design things is going to change in the future. Um, you know, most people who have experience with computer-aided design knows that CAD stands for computer-aided des design. We sort of joke at Autodesk, it's like, well, actually, it's more like computer-aided documentation. But when you design things with computer-aided design, essentially what you're doing is you're creating uh, a description so that you can give it to someone to build. So you're documenting how the thing should be built. The computer's not really aiding you in, in the design all that much, right? But really, and even on the upper... Uh, the upper panel there, that's sort of the state-of-the-art 3D design. You can see it's pretty darn good. I mean, this, those are high-quality parts and stuff like that. You could send those out to be milled. So I'm not going to denigrate, you know, uh, 3D, 3D design because they make my paycheck. And also, it's, it's pretty awesome, too. Uh, however, but when, you, when you actually design something, oddly enough, we always start with the geometry first. We specify the shape first, right? But really... When you, actually, you actually have some goals when you're designing something. So, for example, and I'll walk you through this example to give you an idea of what I mean. Suppose you wanted to design this fan. Uh, and you needed a certain amount of airflow out of it. And you need a certain, you know, you don't want it to be too loud. So there's a certain threshold that, that you want to keep. Right? Now, ultimately, you don't really care what the shape of the fan is. Right? It goes inside of some, some housing. Who cares what it looks, looks like? Strangely enough, in the computer-aided design world, you start off by specifying the shape first. So hopefully you see that's odd. So this is how it happens in the real world. You take one of our products, like in, in Inventor, you design the geometry, or maybe you start with an existing part, uh, and then you run simulations on it to find out whether you're getting the performance that you want. And that's what that bottom pane shows, some com computational flow dynamics that are being run on that. But notice that this is just one design, right? So they say that design is all about choice. So hopefully there'll be some choices involved in your act of designing. Otherwise, you're just sort of documenting what you've already sort of figured out. Uh, and so you think, well, hey, if I do three of these, what I'll do is I'll do three, and then I'll pick the best performing one. And the problem with making multiple designs is it takes time. And if you talk to most professional designers, they sort of joke, Oh yeah, we keep on designing until we either run out of time or money. So it's sort of this, 
thing that you get the design that you've sort of paid for, right? That you've allotted the amount of time. But there's really no sense of getting the best design or getting the optimal design. So I'm going to talk about that. So the real question is, you know, why do we manually design the shape? You know, our real goal is to optimize the airflow and the, and the noise. So in my research group, uh, we're, ex we're exploring, working in this sort of flipped way, right? Uh, and this isn't anything particularly new. It's called goal-driven design. And really the way it works is, rather than starting off by specifying, specifying the shape first, you, you input the goals and the constraints for the design that you want. The computer then automatically generates the, the, the designs, or several of them, and then the computer tests through simulation uh, if the design meets the goal. So with this approach, taking the example of the fan, uh, we can create three designs and pick the best, right? Obvious. But since the computer is doing the work, well, I'll just have my workstation generate a couple dozen designs, and then I'll pick the work, right? I'll pick, I'll pick the best out of it, the one that works the best. But actually, if I get a really good computer, I'll generate hundreds of designs and pick the best out of that, right? Now the real trick of that, and the thing that we're doing, is if we have a cloud of computers, thousands of processors, what can we do? Well, it's sort of obvious that you can generate millions of designs and then pick the best out of the millions. And so you actually end up with what you to be, to be the optimal design, the very best performance, right? So you're probably thinking, oh, there's going to be a catch in here. That's one of those build-up slide things that has a catch in the end. Yeah, well, the catches are a couple, three. So how do you express the goals, right? We don't normally think in terms of goals of our design. They seem to be encapsulated in the artifacts that we produce. But there's this big user interface challenge of how do you express the goals. But it's not as bad as you think. I'll show you an example of why it's not as bad as you think. Uh, then the second question is, how do you automatically generate the, generate the designs? Because at some point you've got to generate some sort of geometry or some sort of shape, some sort of thing, right? And then the last question is, you know, how do you evaluate all these things, right? How do you evaluate thousands of them at the same time, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera? The last one isn't all that daunting. It sort of breaks down into this huge search algorithm. Once you generate them all, it's a simple matter of the way that Google searches thousands of web pages. Uh, so that's not as big a problem as, as, as one, one would think. So, just to encourage you, I think like designing some big thing, inputting all the goals for an automobile, might be a little bit of work, right? But you can think of simple things like angle brackets, like seriously, why in this day and age does someone still have to design the geometry for an angle bracket? When you know that, oh, it's got to withstand this amount of force, lateral force, a twisting force, etc. Those things are pretty simple, and we can input those goals readily. There's probably you know ten different uh, features that we want. Uh, so I think for a large number of the mundane tasks of de designing, those will be done in this manner, much in the same way that when you lay out uh, transistors on a on a computer, it's not the computer chip designer doing that; it's an automatic layout program. So I'll give you some real examples, since I just showed you a piece of metal, not a real example. Uh, here's a real part that we, we made. Uh, uh, this is an experiment to see if we can uh, manufacture a part in this manner to go on a spaceship that's going to the moon. So it's just a little side hobbyist project about going to the moon for the, for the, uh, uh, for the XPRIZE. Uh, and really, this is a very simple function of this part. It has to connect two plates. Uh, it sits on the outside of the craft and it holds the rocket uh, nozzles that allow the craft to manipulate itself through space. Uh, and really, you can build this out of you know, just an angle bracket with maybe a piece of steel or something. But of course, when you're sending stuff to the moon, weight is everything, right? It must be as light as possible and be just strong enough to withstand all the different forces that it's going to encounter over the course. 
So like completely, weight translates completely into money because they just want to get more and more things on the pay, pay and loan. So you're going to put your weight someplace else. So this is a design that our system came up with. And so you notice that it doesn't look like it's designed by you, it's designed by some creepy computer systems. Uh, we can only 3D print it. So this may be printed in some sort of alloy like titanium or some, something like that. But it does what it's supposed to do. Okay, so here's a better, more, uh, more cooler example. Uh, and it'll probably convince you that the notion of expressing the goals is not as hard as one may think. So here's an example of a sort of futuristic bike uh, that some of our designers worked on. And the thing to look at is the form. So a, a designer who was very good at making lovely shaped things and uh, said, oh, I'd like to have a frame that has this shape. And then we use our system to automatically generate the structures that are needed within that shape to support the cyclists and all the various stresses and strains that happens on that bike. So that's the sort of slightly pinkish part that you see there. But if you look closer, it's this sort of crazy network of connecting struts. Now you're probably not going to design that by hand, but a 3D printer will readily print that out for you. So that's an example of, you know, it's actually, you get the, it actually empowers the designer to be even more free because they don't have to worry about the engineering side of it and they don't have to worry about making it out of metal tubes or anything. It's like, well, whatever shape you want, you think that will accomplish the aesthetics that you want. Then we'll have the computer, the computer figure out all the structural parts. And so ultimately, I guess if this was done, and if you look at the poster in the back, you know, it would be finished over. So if you didn't like that crazy spider web approach, you can get something that had a really smooth surface. So hopefully I've given you uh, some insights and in sort of how the act of making and the act of computer-aided design will, will change in the future. So really 3D printing isn't so much about 3D. It's really about digital fabrication, about programmable matter things that we can control with the computer, uh, they have a great advantage and a great application. I don't think other ways of manufacturing woodwork are all going to go away, but you know, uh, 3D printing and its light will certainly have its uses and will be applicable to these other domains like, like life sciences. It cause a lot of intersection between those different domains to do some really super cool stuff. Uh, and like I said, the notion of what is buildable versus you know, the living versus the, versus the non-living, uh, that sort of concept will, will start to change where you'll do stuff like, well, I guess I have a plastic enclosure with an adrenal processor and then a bacterial culture that emits a banana smell you know, when my uncle walks into the room. Those things are all buildable. We can, we can build those with all the things that I showed you in the slide. Okay, take three or four years, maybe a PhD, whatever, but you can do it now. And finally, the last example, I think for the active design, it will become less about sort of documenting yourself and more about working with the computer to get the design that you wanted, more optimized des des designs. <clears throat> so, I sort of made a little bit of argument about it. In the future, we'll be able to make more and better stuff. You know, I'd just like to close by, by saying, you know, there's actually a great opportunity to, to change, change the world here. It's sort of like Steve Jobs says, well, you want to put a ding in the world. And uh, my started taking this like, well, yeah, you want to put a ding in the world, but you want to choose the ding that you make, right? Like some people say, well, my ding in the world is that I made a billion dollars. Be more cool if you say, my ding in the world is I cure cancer or, you know, I solve global warming or stuff like that. So I'm really into the dings. Let's just, let's just choose the ones that really make an impact. And so, ultimately, making is about making a better world, right? It's not about making plastic bobbleheads. Those are the things that we experiment with on our way to making a better world. So I just thought I'd sort of cite a few relevant examples. I've already talked about our buddy Sean, who was working on the nanorobots uh, to cure cancer and stuff like that. Uh, some guys in our, in our research group, Ryan, Ryan Schmidt, they're working with the University of Toronto, where they're using really expensive 
3D scanning and printing technology so that they can manufacture prosthetic limbs for uh, countries that have a lot of poverty. And it's a great application because it's really critical to get a custom fit for, 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 for people who need a prosthetic limb. And so with the technology, we're sort of capable of doing that. We're also doing it in a fairly inexpensive and mobile manner. Uh, finally, my friend Asim Khan, who's working on this project to work on the efficiency of buildings. But most people uh, associate global wiring with you know, pollution caused by cars and vehicles. Turns out it's existing buildings chew up all the power like this building. And of course we're powering them by coal plants and stuff like that. So one thing we can do is make the buildings more efficient. And when you get into that area, it's surprising you know, how, how behind the times that technology is. We have thermostats where the big innovation is like, oh, now it actually you know, it's able to track what you're doing. I mean, wow. It's, so there's a lot of great, great stuff to be done there. And so many other examples, like actually trying to work on the, pro the, the problem of, of uh, sustainability and global warming by just simply providing cleaner, cleaner power. So that's what that last example was. So I hope I've been able to show you some compelling examples of the maybe even the bigger picture of computer-aided design. Um, so if there are any questions, I'm very happy to answer them. Thank you for your attention and for most of you stayed awake, I think it's the day. <laughs> and uh, if you want more information uh, beyond the questions, uh, you can go to auditsresearch.com where you can find out more about some of these things. And that's the end of my talk. Thank you. It's a great talk, and I also noticed a very young audience in the here. So when probably when he grew up, he can sketch some bicycle and print the bicycle at home, not go to Canadian Tire or something. So if you have questions, we have two microphones. Please line up here. Uh, actually, I'll, I'll, I'll like warm up a little bit. Uh, uh, Gord, you, you do notice this uh, Chinese Thai conference. So you oh, haven't okay, talking about like a computer human interaction yet. Uh, do you have another 45 minutes? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I was saying to Wei Lei, well, if nobody asked the question, why don't you ask, hey, Gord, how come there's nothing about you know, computer human action and computer human interaction in your talk? And I'm glad you asked me that question, Wei <laughs> So. Talk. You know, that's, that's my background, right? So I sort of take that stuff as a given. But uh, the big challenges here, I will really just simplify it, is making all this stuff a lot easier to use. I mean, we, it's actually, I find it super frustrating, even if I look at our own tools that we sell, and everybody's tools, it's sort of rooted in developments that happened like 20 years ago. So CAD sort of behaves, it isn't all that much different than the way it behaved 20 years ago. In terms of the, the, uh, the geometry, manipulation underneath and in terms of the user interface. So that part of it has got to change. Hopefully some of the, 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 the HCI community will, will work on that part of that. And second of all, I think the community in general, we tend to focus on sort of the generic, you know, the office worker, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And I think it's really valid to say like, we should build great interfaces so that scientists, engineers, and designers and stuff can work easily with their tools. Like I said in that example of the guys that were using DNA to build these microscopic structures, uh, you know, it was completely stunning to me that people that at the Nobel Prize level of intelligence are saying, yeah, can you make this easier to use? Because we can't quite figure out how to do it, right? And we're trying to empower this whole community to do it. So that still remains a very important thing. Uh, and then just jumping one level down from that, in things like this last project that I talked talk to you about. Clearly there's those things that we don't know how to do at the user interface level. We really don't know, like, what's the best way to express the goals to the machine? How do you modify them? How do you represent them? We also don't know how to deal with design variations when you're dealing with millions of them. And maybe when your goals aren't specified right either. So there's a whole bunch of human computer interaction issues there that are, I think, really deep, deep and rich. So that answers your preloaded question. <laughs> okay, so if you're talking about um, making better tools, 
And meanwhile, as you were talking, you're doing a lot of gesture. So have you thought about having gesture as part of the tool in the making or in the specification about programmable or like dealing with the 3D yeah, yeah. and stuff like that? Um, yeah, well, I have a little bit of background in gesture stuff. So uh, um, I'm highly skeptical of the, uh, the, the, the Tom Cruise example. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, Minority Report. And I sort of, every couple of years I write about how that's not going to really happen for various sort of reasons. Uh, but there is something there. And, uh, you know, recently I read articles where they're, what they're finding is that people learn better when they physically move. And you know for a fact, like, when you work with your hands, when you're a wood worker, that working manually has some sort of value, but we're not really measuring it, or we don't really understand it. So if anybody out there wants to stick somebody, a woodworker, in a, you know, a CAT scan, we'll find out what's going on in your brain, you know, with maybe with, uh, you know, uh, MRI machines. I'm really curious about that and how much that will help. Uh, anybody who's actually used computer and design tools, you know, there's always these classic things where people say, oh, look, I built this gesture-based system. I can, I can uh, scale an object, and, and maybe I can move around my viewpoint. And maybe even for bonus points, I can do a cross-section and look at the various parts. It's like, dude, like, your design's already done, so that's, that's called viewing. So, we don't have a lot of problems viewing the models now. We do have problems understanding the really complicated things that are involved when you actually make something. Right? It's a little hard to explain why that's such a problem. Uh, but those, there, there's plenty of rich areas beyond sort of the basic gesturing about how I do things. And I'm not saying you can't make great advances with it. And the iPad and the, the simple things that Apple did were great. Right? Uh, they could have been better, uh, that's another whole talk. Uh, so they have some value, but I don't think there's, there's, there's not a fundamental thing about gestures that are really going to crack open the design problem. Des design is still a really rich problem, more like, yeah, I have the basic design, now I want to change it, I want to add this, I need to get the requirements, what do I build this out of? There's so much more to it than just the specification of the shape. Yeah, question? So uh, the question I have is, whenever you use Autodesk for other forms of uh, offering tools, uh, most of the time you are learning them, and then as you are learning them, your thought process becomes skewed into the processes that are dictated by the software. And then that could have changed totally your original design or, or, or what you were trying to do, uh, you know, because you have to find a way to put into that mold. Right, right. Yep. So, um, what would be the correct direction forward, such that we could, you know, manifest what we're really thinking, than to have to go through this complicated and rather painful process? Because I'm learning it now. It's it's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> you, you said it, yeah. yeah it's really crazy. Uh, well, so two, two comments on that. Um, one is that um, it's like you know, take it easy. It's like a medium. When you, when, when you work with wood, working with wood is crazy. It's like there's all these crazy rules you have to learn, and wood works and changes over time, and it's hard to cut. There's, and so I don't think the computer medium is any more crazy than natural real materials and other mediums. Not saying that it could be a whole lot better. Definitely could be a whole lot better. I'm not saying that. So it's, but I think we sort of expect that it to be this completely malleable, I can, you know, I imagine the design, and then somehow it gets directly expressed in the software and everything's good and flowers come up and it's a sunny day. Uh, that would be great. Uh, I don't think design is that simple. But then the second point, and I think the more important point is that there's this sort of point of view that I've been getting lately. It's like, for some reason, uh, we well, let me, let me say this way. I'm a firm believer that your tool should be your textbook. And for some reason, you know, we ship you these pieces of software, and it's like, okay, we're sending you the saw, but with no instructions on how to use it. And, it, and, the, and the instructions basically are stuff like, to cut a piece of wood, place the saw on the, on, on the material and move it back and forth. But anyone who's used a tool knows that all the context surrounding how you use any tool is super important. Like, well, how do I use a saw to cut soft balsa wood? Do I move it fast or slow? 
What about the act of building? What are you trying to build? If you're building a doghouse, you use a saw in a certain manner versus etc. etc. So I'm almost thinking, well, we need to we need to embed the whole process of learning a domain in the tool itself. So because so many projects I do are these stupid projects where you know I want to do something that I'm not trained in doing, and so I start off not by learning the domain. I start off by using the saw, you know, by using the tool, which makes no sense. Uh, so it'd be nice if the tools had embedded in them the actual domain knowledge you used to design within that realm. I don't know if any of that makes sense, but in my mind that sort of addresses some of the stuff that you're talking about. Yes, sir? So, um, one of the bottleneck of the 3D printing is speed. Right? Do you have any, do you see anything that's out there that can make it print much faster than what's it's doing right now? Or? Yeah, there are some technologies that do sort of not so much point by point by they'll do sort of a laser blast on a table of materials. Uh, so those things will help. Uh, but beyond that, I mean, I'm not really up on a lot of it. A lot of it's got to do too with sort of smart, uh, smart planning of how the part is printed out and stuff like that, uh, and smarter things with support structures. We're doing a little bit of research in that area. Um, but yeah, speed becomes speed is sort of fundamentally a problem because although you get complexity for free, if you want complexity, you know you get to have it sort of visit all the sites in the thing that it's printed. Yeah, I'd like your example with uh, with the bike. Now, if the bike is designed by a team here in Toronto, one in Tokyo, where the parts are made, maybe in the third country where it's going to be used and where there are special ergonomics conditions. I mean, I guess that that distributed team can work on the CAD model, on the digital model, and then they can work on the physical model when when, when you print it. Have you deliberated on how to how to combine world work? I mean distributed teamwork in, in, in the digital world or versus in the printed version of the bike? Yeah, well, not so much with the printed part. I mean, there's a couple different ways. Like, how do you work in a, in a distributed manner? Mm -hmm. And, you know, we, we have tools that are basically you know, social networking websites where yeah. this design is at the core of it. So you share the models and you work in different times. And so that stuff's all sort of standard. The notion of printing the physical and then getting it back into the design process, uh, uh, that's a critical thing. And for example, most people don't know this, but uh, automotive manufacturers, when they're designing a body shape, they'll do a full 3D print of a car, right? So it's a full-size car in clay. Some designers will come in and modify the bits that they don't want in clay. They'll scan it back in during the night, and it'll be loaded back into the software in the morning for the designers to start again. So ultimately, we need to support what, what we call is uh, scan, modify, print, and then go back again, work, work, workflow. So I think that's what you're talking about. Uh, it's, it's difficult to do. Uh, it, it has to be done. Eventually the industry will, uh, that will be very standard, that we scan everything as a starting point. But we're really sort of only, only at the start of that. If you ever try to use 3D, 3D scanning, it's like, oh my god, this is even harder than 3D printing. So when, when it works, it's wonderful. Uh, and when it doesn't work, it's like, I don't know why this isn't working, sort of thing, so. Yeah, so, yeah, so, uh, I, I seem to hear that uh, you are you're talking about automating the design process and the design as search. Uh, but uh, the other aspect, I guess, is think design as a creativity process. So, do you have any thoughts about how this can help creativity? Well, I was hoping that my bicycle example would sort of show that. Yeah. In that case, the designer was would be much more creative. He didn't have to make it out of tubes, right? So he had a, he had, a, he, had a, or he could not only make it out of tubes. He could make it out of many other different sort of shapes. So I really don't think that a higher level taking the Monday work out of computer aided design is going to make people have less freedom in their designs. Because when you design something, you know the constraints of the underlying engineering and stuff are huge. So if you have some latitude in that as a designer, uh, then that actually op op opens up your world. Uh, because although people think, oh, it'd be so great if I didn't have to worry about all that stuff. Well, no, actually, you have to worry about the stuff because you're building the thing. So your real goal is to build the thing. So designs that don't work, well, a, a designer could be in love with the geometry and stuff like that. They don't 
it shouldn't really care because that does not work. Uh, and so it sort of depends sort of where you're setting your goal within this thing. So I actually think the future is sort of brighter for people designing things. Because I'm like, whenever I do structural stuff, uh, of any sort of complexity, I tend to get it wrong. It'd be nice if the computer just figured that out for me. Since you mentioned buildable, so I am curious about what cannot be built with a 3D printer. So what? Uh, what the structures or anything that cannot be built with well, that cannot be built with a 3D printer. Uh, does anybody know the answer to that? Can I get a comment on that? Well, you know, like I listed, there's a whole bunch of different things, different size, different sizes, and stuff like that. Uh, the thing that's really frustrating that I really wish 3D printers would do right now is electronic component placement. Because that whole world, like there's a whole world of parts out there, electronic parts. Like if you want to make a box, let's say you build a circuit board, or you want to build a robot like I did a couple years ago, and you want to specify the robot has this function, arms and stuff like that. And it'd be really great if the computer just figured out, okay, here's how I get all the little connectors in there and stuff like that. Right? Uh, and it'd be even better... If it did that, and then you sent it off to a printer that not only printed out all the plastics, but it had a bin where it picked in the parts and dropped them in, into place. <laughs> so they can't do stuff like that. It seems a pretty reasonable thing to do. Uh, I think somebody's going to do it. Um, there's, there's, there's definitely a bajillion, or there's definitely many, uh, <laughs> there's, there's definitely many things that 3D printers can do, but it's, it's a huge problem when they do it. Uh, some very subtle things, like if you print struck, everything is being, the thing you're printing is being pulled down by gravity as you print it, so you have to put supporting structures in to hold it up. And the supporting structure can be a big problem, because what if you encase it in plastic and you can't get it out? So there's a whole bunch of things that, that cannot be done with a 3D printer, or you have to be very clever to figure out ways to, to, to do it. Yes, uh, I just wonder how how some sort of service design or user center design or user experiences can be integrated with the goal-driven design. And uh, uh, as, as you know, we are now uh, more focused on the natural user interface. And what will be the natural user interface for the, the, the uh, goal-driven design? Right. So, I'm the biggest non-believer in natural user interfaces. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right so there's no the such thing as natural in my, in my world. Uh, I did come up with something that I thought was really natural. Maybe at some level there are things, and maybe at sort of the gesture level there are some natural things. Uh, you know, I don't even really think about any one sort of user-centric design. Um, I just think about well, what's someone trying to do. I'm trying to build a doghouse. Let's give them everything they need to know to build a doghouse. Here's examples of doghouses. Here's how they're built. Here's a website. You can actually order a doghouse and you don't have to design it. So maybe that is user-centered design, but it's so closely linked to task that I, I can't see strongly. I don't see the you know a lot of information about the users being uh, the fundamental factor. But like I've never got a big pers pers persona guy be like you know. Uh, Whaley gets up at 6 in the morning, he drives into work, and he has a cup of coffee, and then he sits down to design a, a, ball, a ball, ball bearing. Well, I didn't need to know that he came in that morning, except to maybe know that he's a little bit blurry from the coffee or something like that. Um, so I, I, I'm a real sort of task-based guy, and fully understanding all the context of what people are trying to do. I think computers do sort of a miserable job of that. Like, it's, it's totally bizarre that, you know, when you open up most pieces of software, they've completely forgotten their last interaction with you. I guess PowerPoint brought up my last set of slides. But most of the time, at least a couple years ago, they always would come up blank. It's like, hey, glad to meet you for the first time. <laughs> so there's just some real basic things, or basic inputting of tasks that we do to give information to people. And we've done some stuff in our research group uh, where it's just horribly practical. If we want to teach somebody something, we actually record everything they do on the computer for that something that they're trying to do and allow them to see it and find out every detail because they need every de de detail. So that's sort of my take on that. Okay, on that note, the coffee is out there, so please bring... Uh, uh, actually, uh, let's get uh, another... <laughs> uh, to our 
Well, thank you. We actually talk, right? actually we all the way from Taiwan. Some like a little gift for oh, from the Salmon Lake. This is tea from Salmon Lake. Very famous in Taiwan. Thank you.